Right, so today my search for transformational objects takes me to the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge to meet with the senior curator, Dr. Anita Hurley. Hello, Anita. Hello. Thanks so much for joining me. Good to meet you. And I believe that you might have a a transformational object that we can uh, discuss and talk about. Indeed, I do. There are are a number of objects like that within the museum, but I wanted to draw attention to an outstanding object that sort of remarkably points to the transformation between humans and things and the the transformative potential of colour. It's in an exhibition that I curated um, Colour, Art, Science and Power, which is on at the Museum of Arcanath until the 23rd of April of this year. And it looks at how at colour as the, at the transforming potential of colour. Now, if we look at this headdress, it's a Mandurucu headdress from um, Brazil, from the Amazon. And it's made of feathers, and it's remarkable in many ways. When, if you look at it closely, along the back, there are some red and blue long macaw feathers, which would hang down to the back of the shoulders of the wearer. But the crown, which is what I want to draw your attention to, is made up of these tufts of yellow um, feathers with little streaks of red. And it was made through an amazing transformative process called taparaje, in which feathers are, the color of feathers are changed on a living parrot. On a living parrot? On a living parrot. So we are sitting, as you say, in front of this uh, museum case with a fantastically colorful headdress made out of parrot feathers, as you say, and the top portion of it, the crown of it, that the feathers are all golden, orangey, yellow, aren't they? Yes. And those you're saying were originally regular parrot-coloured feathers, which have somehow been transformed, the colour has been changed on them? Indeed. So, taparaje is a practice by which a li- the feathers are plucked, not all of them, but feathers are plucked from a living parrot, and then a... Um, substance is put on which is largely composed of the secretion of the back of a frog and you put the this mixture onto the parrot's skin and when the feathers grow back they are this color this golden color sometimes with bursts of red now in this instance the feathers would have been from a parrot very similar to the one you see here which is a, a green colored green feathered parrot um, from Brazil from the same reason. Wow. It, I mean, so many questions, but it does boggle the mind as to how anybody came up with the idea in the first place. Well, let's, let's take a few feathers out, rub a, rub a frog over it and, and see what happens. Indeed. In fact, that's one of the questions that often arise and I'm afraid I'm not able to answer. Um, we know that it's been practiced for a long time. Um, the first European account of it is from a journal by Carl Friedrich Philipp um, von Martis. So in 1817, he was sent by the king of Bavaria, uh, Maximilian I, to go to the Amazon. Now, he was a naturalist, an ornithologist, an explorer, and he wrote this three-volume series of his experiences in Brazil. The mainly focuses on zoology, and ornithology, but he does have um, some great descriptive details of the people who were there, as well as some um, illustrations. And here you can see a man from that period, so about 1817 to 1820, wearing a headdress that is remarkably similar to the one that we have on display in the case. And do we know anything about how it was used or what the role it had in the life of the uh, the tribe that that produced it? I think it's important to to acknowledge that there is a really close affinity between people and parrots in the Amazon. Um, It's part of a much more sort of holistic cosmology about the relationship between people, um, birds and the environment that surrounds them. So for a lot of Amazonian groups, they would take young parrots 
from the nest or eggs from the nest and bring them into the house. And the parrots lived in the house with people. They were the only animals that actually lived inside the house. Their perch would be there. And when they passed away, and of course parrots, um, their lifespan is quite long, they would actually be buried within the household complex. There was this very close relationship between people and parents. So these, these headdresses with these amazing colorful crowns um, was associated with the celestial realm and they were used in communal dances so people would be dancing and there'd be a sense um, that dancing is like flying that it's like being that you're actually transforming yourself into a bird and so these dances help to take you up to this celestial realm that you share with this bird that, you, that lives in your household. So there's this incredible interconnection. So the color is both transformed by the process of taparahe, but probably equally, if not more importantly, that the, the headdress itself transforms people into bird-like creatures which can fly near to the sun. Well, so there really is that sense in which um, it's a really different connection to the environment and this headdress in particular, the way it is used and put on, you're literally, well, metaphorically changing your mindset, as it were, and almost a bit like kind of magic realism or magic thinking about your environment, which we have seen seem to have lost or lost that sense of connection with our own environment very much, very largely in this country, I think. Indeed. I mean, it is really part of a much more holistic cosmology that, that um, people in the Amazons have generally. One of the things also in terms of how these headdresses were used was that it was a communal practice. So you've got that sense of a whole group of people doing this thing, dance, doing it repetitively, and that idea that through that process of dance, through the ceremonial activity itself, has also a transforming potential. So it works together um, with the choreography, so to speak. So it really does transform the mindset, and, it, and it's an object that, that has this, that, this sense of being able to help us see things differently, respond differently, interact differently, and build up a much richer sense of who we are and our place in the world. Indeed. And a sense of veneration towards it, I think. Indeed. Which is so important. And to sort of be mimicking almost the actions of the sparrows and the birds in the Amazon, which are, you know, so colourful. That's interesting, isn't it? That, 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 that they, they um, revere the parrots so much that, in fact, they, they want to be like them. And as you say, it's an act of almost trying to fly. And, and that sense of kind of being up in, in the celestial sphere is, is transformative and just a, a new sense of perspective on everything, isn't it? Yeah. And also, I think the colour is really important. Parrots are very colourful birds. And there isn't a lot of colour in the Amazon, a lot of very coloured. So with some of the other headdresses and the feather work, it isn't just headdresses that, that people make. Um, people have described feathers as being like their paint box as something, and you can see this in this other um, smaller headdress here, which I always think looks very much like it would be um, appreciated by Iggy Stardust. It's something you could imagine David Bowie wearing. Yeah, you? so we, we've got we've got something that's like a half globe, isn't it? And it of, of, of parrot feathers again, and, and, and the reds and the blues that we, we traditionally associate with parrots, but also this shock of, of yellow gold running through it yeah. as well. So here, that, that's not made by the process of taparaje, but it's there as an example of thinking about colour and how people, the aesthetics of colour in different places and the materiality of colour in different places. So here, this is like, as I said, almost like a paint box, is that you can take a blue feather and a red one and you make this uh, these elaborate ornaments or, and headdresses out of them. So... Can you tell me a little bit about the background research to the headdress? Yes. So as part of the exhibition, um, I both contacted um, specialists from different areas, including in some instances members of indigenous communities. But with this particular case, 
Um, I worked very closely with an anthropologist named Stephen E. Jones, who has been working in the Amazon for all, over 50 years and first got me excited and, in fact, indeed aware that we had material that originated from this remarkable practice of taparaje. But we also contacted the ornithologists at the University Museum of Zoology across the road. And I had a couple come over here who are specialists in birds of South America. And when they saw the headdress, they were completely blown away. They had never seen anything like it because they could identify immediately that there were that they were parrot feathers um, on the top and that they could link them with um, type specimens that they have in zoology of, of parrots from the Amazon. But They'd, ne they'd never seen anything like that color. So it was quite remarkable to be with these experts on parrots and for them to also see um, the human, trans her human transformation through this process of um, changing the color of feathers on living parrots. Amazing, amazing, isn't it? And do we know anything about how these wonderful objects came to be in Cambridge and in, in the museum? Well, we know who donated it. It was donated by a, an Italian ornithologist and anthropologist named Enrico Giglioli in 1901. It was acquired sometime in the late 19th century, we assume. Um, but we don't know, while he had traveled um, extensively, we don't know whether he actually collected this himself or whether it was something that he exchanged. He was very active, as is very common among collectors at the time, to, was very active with exchanges. So he exchanged material with the British Museum, he exchanged material with the Smithsonian in Washington. Um, a very, very common practice. A lot of his materials would have been um, ornithological. And so you can imagine that he just would have really, this would have been an exceptionally uh, outstanding piece for him, combining his interests in birds and his interests in ethnography. So this was collected 100, 150 years ago. Are they still doing it today, practicing? As far as we know, the Manduraku are no longer practicing taparaje. They have been, it's another one of these, you know, horrific stories of, from the Amazon of people having been displaced. I mean, typically they live, and some still live, but some of them have been moved um, in sort of savannas that are within the rainforest um, near the rivers. They've been affected a lot by damming, by the dams for hydroelectric power. In fact, in 2013, a sacred rapids along the river were dynamited to make way for the construction of the dam. So it was like their sacred space for some of these people was completely and utterly destroyed. However, this is a practice that was shared among many Amazonian groups, and we know that there are still groups in Col along the Colombian Amazon that are still practicing taparaje. So it still exists, but I don't think it exists among the Mandaruku. It's heartbreaking to hear these stories, and we know we get the headlines of, of what might be happening in the Amazon, but this makes it all the more particular and the more specific and the more real in a way. And um, as part of the project that, that uh, I'm working on with the, the Library of the Great Silence, it's all about trying to step back and, and change the errors of our ways. And, and this is, you know, no more clearer example really than, than, than what's happening um, in the Amazon. So, Well, you might say with indigenous peoples overall, the extent now to which they're resisting um, you know, the impact of industrialization, the, the kinds of um, cl climate change activities that are happening. They were very, very active in Scotland, weren't they, with groups from around the world coming to, to protest, but also to say, look, our ways of lives, we took care of our environment. Our environment was an important part of, well, obviously it's an important part for all of us. Exactly, and, and that's a really nice way of put, putting it, because trying to 
pick out the, the bits of positive in, in all of these stories is that there is a sense of pushing back now and a sense of resistance and a sense of realisation that things do need to change, need to transform and, and we can learn a lot from um, the very people who, who, who learned to live within and around their environment so successfully for so long. Absolutely. Absolutely, and you see this in many different places of the world, the way that people care for their environments and have done so for millennia. Well, this has been a fantastic opportunity to learn about the parrot headdress and the amazing transformational capabilities that it has. And so finally, I just wondered if you could say a few words about the role of museums such as this more generally in in helping us with thinking differently about things. Well, the museum is, museums like the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology are places which um, collect and take care of materials from around the world and are one of the places that not only records but makes available, accessible to our visitors through exhibition the, the, and the, that both celebrates the creativity of indigenous and other peoples from around the world, but also um, highlights, I think, cultural difference and similarities and gives us an opportunity to be able to reflect on it. One of the things that this museum is very committed to is to developing productive relationships with the people from whom the material originates. And we have probably over 50 visiting researchers a year who come from places where our collections come from to work with these collections. We're also acutely aware that some of the material, some of it has come to us through detailed field work, through exchange, through commissions, but we also have material that's in the museum that have come from less salubrious circumstances, from out and out loot, from material that has been stolen. And those are things that we also acknowledge here by working with groups, by working for returning material to communities, um, where sometimes the return of material can have a great benefit in terms of cultural healing, um, intergenerational um, knowledge transfer, etc. So it is an amazing um, resource for a whole range of activities and different kinds of audiences, both our communities and international audiences that come to us here in Cambridge, as well as to uh, representatives of many of the hundreds, if not thousands, of groups of people that are represented by the collections within this museum. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for um, spending this time with me. We are collecting for our library at the Alison Richard Building objects of transformational change, and sadly and quite understandably, the parrot headdress is going to have to stay here and it's not going to be moving to our little library of of objects, but maybe it can be like an honorary member for the duration of our project and inducted as an honorary member for the Library of the Great Silence. Indeed, I I hope so, and I hope it also encourages people to come across town and to to the museum and see the objects both in the colour exhibition um, and in the other displays that we have here at the museum. Thank you so much.